Good morning, Len Bitopic here, standing in for Ian Collins. And we're at that time of the day when we introduce our news panel. And this week we have two superb contributors, if I say so myself. Elizabeth Jones, who's UKIP's prospective parliamentary candidate for Dartford at this year's general election, and also political blogger Mark Thompson. Elizabeth, good morning to you. Uh, you Good morning to you, Lempert. I'm very well. Thank you. All the better for seeing you. Oh, you say all the right things. I do. (laughs) Poacher turned gamekeeper on on this side of the (laughs) panel now, so I'll have some no funny business at all. I just want facts and the truth. Um, It must be getting very busy for you in the run-up to the uh, general election. Indeed it is. We we are canvassing on a regular basis now in Dartford for UKIP and of course the big story for Dartford uh, happened yesterday when we had for once and once for the final time clarification for Tesco's that they are not proceeding with a low field street development and this is a huge letdown for Dartford. I mean talk about being dumped on. It really really is bad news for Dartford and frankly you know the council there shows a complete lack of vision there's been an over-reliance on the single developer, namely Tesco's. Tesco's has already more or less demolished 70% of the properties in that street. And it was quite clear six months ago that Tesco's was highly unlikely to develop the site in any event. I see this as a big fail by Dartford Mm. Borough Council. And when we look at Dartford Borough Council, okay, the average salary for people in Dartford's 29,000. We have the... That was a party political broadcast (laughs) on behalf of Elizabeth Jones. I salute you for making the most of the moment. Let's get back to that if we can do. But in the meantime, I have to give uh, a right of reply on whatever you'd like to say to Mr Thompson. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, fine. Thanks, Lambert. How are you doing? Not bad, yes. Long time no see. And, Indeed, uh, yeah. Thanks for coming on to my show, as they say. Mm, no, <laughs> no, no problem. Last, last time we were together, we were both guests, so there's been a shift in the power dynamic. I, I know. For better or for worse, I'll leave for the listener to decide. <laughs> uh, you must be getting quite busy in the run-up to the election as well as a, as a commentator. Well, yeah, I've, I've written some pieces and uh, also I've, st- I've started up uh, my podcast again for the new year in the run-up to the election. Uh, we already put one out a few days ago, so we're starting to, to cover the issues in, in that respect. But yes, it's going to be uh, a very busy few months, I think. I'll probably join you in some studios as well. So Indeed. anyway, there we are. I'm sorry to cut you off, Elizabeth, there. No but uh, we'll, You will both have plenty of time to speak. The self-denying ordinance for me is to let you express your views and keep mine to myself. So let's move to the first subject. Very interesting one here. The father of a 15-year-old boy who took his own life at a young offenders institute in Kent says his son was too young to go to jail. Alex Kelly died at Cookham Wood in Rochester in 2012 and he's one of no less than 33 children to have died while serving prison terms in this country since 1990. Pretty big number. Alex's dad, Nick Poppett, says it was the wrong place for him to be. At a time when I was 15 years old, that, or any, any child... That age, there's still children that shouldn't be put in prison. They should have been put in either a hostel to safeguard them properly, to find out the issues are, what was mental health and what the big, what the, was what Alex gone for himself as a youngster to make sure they be, be, should be looked after properly. That was uh, Nick Poppett, the father of Alex, who died in prison. Is 15 too young to be locked up? Uh, What's the most fitting punishment for a child or teenager who commits a serious crime? What's your take on this, Elizabeth? Well, my take on this is that a great deal of research has gone into this. We... uh Borstal, that is the youth offender prisons, began actually in Kent, in Borstal in 1902. And from 1902 uh, have evolved into the Youth Offender Institute. A great deal uh, of research, as I said, has gone into considering the best way forward for handling juvenile delinquents. And also the juvenile delinquents lifestyle has been it has been reflected in cinema as well. We have Clockwork Orange, we have Skirm, Alan Parker's 1979 mm. film, we have Offender in 2012, and it can present as a nightmarish a dystopian period in one's life. For instance, we have the Medamsley Detention Centre in Durham, where during the 1970s to 1980s, mm. many boys were subject yeah. to anal rape, and in 2009, mm. the Ministry of Justice had to pay £500,000 compensation. It, it, I mean, it's a bad situation in that sense. Mark Thompson, you've been considering this as well. What's your take on this? Well, 
I mean, I think in this country we lock too many people up full stop, and I think there's there's a fairly irrational debate over law and order. I mean, what you often find is that politicians just try to outbid each other on who can be toughest on crime, and we see Chris Grayling at the moment, who's the Justice Secretary, you know, and he is one of the worst offenders in that respect, I think, in, in the way that he's gone about things. And, I mean, you know, correlation is not necessarily causation, but suicides in general have gone up in the last few years, and I think people are still scrabbling to understand why that is but i'm sure the kind of posturing that you've seen from from some members of the current government have not helped in that respect and i think when it comes to younger offenders you know i think once they're on the treadmill of being in a prison then that that sets the course of the of their life then you know too often we see you know youngsters who are in prison when they're teenagers and they just reoffend. there's not there's not good rehabilitation so recidivism is very high yeah. and i just feel like that there has to be a better way in some cases not in all cases in some cases you know kids will have to go to prison if what they've done is horrendous enough but you yeah. know there's, there's not enough lo- looking at the alternatives uh, elizabeth what do we do do we rehabilitate do we put people in prison just to make it look like we're tough well, of course, the first the first duty is to ensure that criminal justice justice is maintained and that the law abiding public are protected. There are ample schemes for youth offenders. We have the secure training centres. There are four in the United Kingdom. They're private and run but- by Serco. We have a secure children homes. There are ten of those whereby children are educated. Do they actually trained. work? Do you think they work? Well, if you look at the surveys done, I think that the children who attend, particularly the secure children homes, get a lot out of it. And similarly with the secure training centres. However, the has been a lot of controversy with the secure training centres concerning their physical restraint. Yep. Uh, a big problem, of course, is government cutbacks. You have to understand about eight prisons have gone, a third uh, of the prison staff has yep. gone, the prison population has increased considerably, particularly with the, I think, with the juvenile those, defendants. Those, have gone those are points about the government, but uh, Mark Thompson, do you think that we've actually got this nailed uh, in a sensible way, or do you think that we're just simply locking up the problem and making it worse? Well, I mean, the justice system does have to serve a number of different purposes. And, you know, I think punishment does need to be part of it. But like I I said earlier, I just think there's an irrational debate about this. And I think politicians find it very difficult to discuss this in a nuanced way because I think probably they're afraid of of negative press coverage. I mean, we we saw um, a vote a year or two ago in Parliament about whether or not, uh, you know, prisoners should have the vote. And there was a huge, overwhelming majority of the House of Commons voted against that idea. You know, there, there were only a few MPs who, who voted in favour of can that. Can I just hold up one second. Do you support the vote or not, Elizabeth, for prisoners out of interest? Uh, UKIP does not support the vote okay. for prisoners. All right, carry yeah, on. So- so, so that's such an, such an absolutist position of you know, anyone who's in prison for any reason. And you think most people who are in prison will be out within... So obviously we're, we're coming up to a general election now, but let's say after May. Most people in prison after May will be coming out within five years. So they, they would be affected by you know by uh, you know what what the what they would have voted for once they're on the outside again and yet there's just there's no real debate about this it's like politicians are just terrified of saying what they perceive to be the wrong okay. thing on Elizabeth, it. you're yes. going to be standing on the stump getting votes are you just following a line what do you feel in your heart should happen for young offenders? It's a very complex problem because we don't know what causes these uh, children to behave in this way. Uh, much of it is a result of ingrained pattern of maladaptive behaviours and that comes from uh, childhood experience, environment, even genetics. We just don't know what causes it. And 73% of juvenile delinquents reoffend. We st- We really can't say mm. what is causing it and we don't know if we even throw lots of government money. Okay. Can it be resolved? But you want to be in government. If, if you were the Home Secretary, what would you do about juvenile ju- ju- juvenile offenders and locking them up? I would concentrate very much on vocational training, get them out trained to be plumbers, electricians, something practical, something they can put their physical energies into. Uh, that sounds sensible to me, Mark. Um, well, I mean, I wouldn't have a, a problem with, with, you know, that side of things where you're actually trying to, to you know, to, to give them something useful to do. But I know I do think, you know, the fact obviously UKIP have this blanket idea that, you know, prisoners can't have votes. And, and you know, it, it's much wider than that. It's, it's just all about how they're seen as somehow less than human. You know, you've taken away their liberty and, you know, you're locking them up in their cells for 22 or 23 hours a day, you know. And, and yet it's seen like, you know, if they have any kind of, uh, you know, entertainment in their cells or, and we saw the whole thing about the, the ban 
ban on books. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of people in this country who thought that that was fair enough, that prisoners shouldn't have books. But really having no idea about what it's like to be locked up for that many hours and have nothing to do. That's, and, you know, the, the mm. idea that, that, that that's the, there's going to be a good outcome from that is ridiculous. It seems to me there's no consensus. We can agree on that for now. Lembitopic standing in for Ian Collins. And I myself am joined by my two good friends, Elizabeth Jones from UKIP and Mark Thompson, who is a political blogger. Now, figures were released this week showing that in 2014, all, not some, but all, of Kent's hospital trusts failed to meet the government's target for waiting times in accident and emergency departments. Labour leader Ed Miliband accused the government of betraying patients, as the political row over the problems facing A&E units across the country has obviously deepened. Stephanie De Giorgio is a GP in Deal. A&E is just a symptom of the problems that are going on at the moment. If you think of A&E just as a bubble, and if you press on A&E, everything else goes a bit wrong. Things to think about are that people can't be discharged from hospital because social care is so lacking at the moment. So who's to blame for the problems in our A&E departments? Is it the doctors, the politicians, out of hours services? Or are some patients simply to blame because they're clogging up waiting rooms unnecessarily? Elizabeth Jones, who do you blame? Well, I'm going to blame the EU. <laughs> I'm also... <laughs> I'll see what you did there. You kept... Good job. <laughs> I'm, also going, I'm also going to say that the patients do mm. uh, need to understand that A&E doesn't stand for anything everything. All right, very good. <laughs> oh, very good. Very, all right, Mark Thompson, uh, we have uh, the finger of blame pointing at the European Union. What's your take? Uh, I'm just so impressed at how Elizabeth was able to segue so <laughs> so smoothly into that. Um, I mean, I, I think you you listed a whole series of potential blamies uh, yeah. just in, in in at the top, um, and I think all of those probably bear some some of the blame because I think there are too many people turning up in A and E who probably shouldn't be there. But at the same time, you know, if they can't get a, a GP appointment in in a reasonable time frame, um, or if they ring one one one, but one 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 tell them that they should go to A and E because they're being too risk averse. I think there is a funding problem, but the current government has uh, ring-fenced the NHS in a way that actually Labour never promised to do. So th these problems may well have been the case under Labour as well. I think I think mm. it's a kind of intractable problem, and we're going to see more and more of this in the coming years and decades, because frankly, we're all getting older, we're all living longer, and you know th there are lots of uh, health problems at the end of life, and I just don't think the NHS, the way it's currently constituted, is going to be able to cope well, with that. Elizabeth Jones blames the EU. You blame everybody. Body. So what do we do about this, Mark? If you, are, if you were to be appointed the Cabinet Minister responsible for solving this problem, what do you do? Well, I mean, the first thing that we need to do in this country, and this isn't something that any one person can do, is try and take the politics out of the debate around the NHS, because every time... Any, so if the Tories are in government and they try to do anything, Labour just scream and scream and scream that they are privatising the NHS without even defining what, those, what that term means. So, you know, even if there might be some private provision internally within the NHS, as long as it's still free at the point of use, as far as I'm concerned, that's fine as long as it's helping with patient outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that, you know, Labour, for their own part, when they've been in power and they've tried to do things, you've had people on the far left screaming that they're yeah. privatising it and then, you know, the, the other parties attacking them. I think we need some, some element of consensus here that if we're going to move forward in the coming decades, things need to change and it ne it, there needs to be a consensus on this. Otherwise, we're just going to see this again and again and again. OK, congratulations, Elizabeth. You've just been elected and you are now in charge of the UK, the England and Wales NHS. How do you solve this problem? Well, I solve this problem by immediately withdrawing from the European <laughs> Directive 2438EC. <laughs> no more freedom of movement. You're not coming here just to pitch up and use our A&E departments. But Elizabeth, that is a frac that is a tiny, tiny fraction of the problem here. That is not going to solve it. It's, it's barely a rounding error on the, uh, the NHS balance sheet. an extra sheet. quarter million of people per annum. More, more people, more hospital beds. Also, but, but most of those people are working in higher proportion than the native population and therefore they're helping to pay for the NHS. But they're still using the beds and the facilities. If we look at the Republic of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland has instituted a policy whereby if you haven't had a GP referral and you turn up at A&E, you have to pay €100. Euros. Well, I'm not suggesting we do that for this country, of course, but it's something to think about. Also, we need to look at the staffing structure. We're spending £120 million per annum on locums. We need to work out, is there proper cover for weekends, evenings? What's going on? Uh, Mark Thompson, last word to you. 
Um, well, uh, I mean, I think it's very easy to, to blame, you know, the EU and to blame immigrants. But frankly, you know, that, that is just a drop in the ocean here. And I think there are severe structural issues. And, you know, our, our politics, the way it's practised at the moment, is just not helping in this situation at all. You know what? You two make me feel glad, glad about I don't have to solve any of the problems. I only have to ask the questions. It's Lembit Opik here, standing in for Ian Collins, and we are blessed with an outstanding news panel in the form of Elizabeth Jones and Mark Thompson. The next story you may have seen, a very interesting one, raising some moral questions. The Conservative Member of Parliament, Mark Pritchard, has called for a review into whether people accused of rape should be given anonymity in the same way that victims are. His call came after police dropped their entire investigation and any potential charges into an allegation of rape made against him this week. Sadly, as an MP, sometimes you have a target on your back. Of course, she remains anonymous. The law on anonymity does need to be reviewed, and fairness does need to play a greater part in these cases. At the moment, as I say, victims of rape and other sex offences are granted lifelong anonymity, but the same legal protection is not afforded to those accused of it. Let me stress, not people who found guilty, but people accused of it, should the law be changed. Mark. Um... Well, I mean, I've been following this debate quite closely for the last few years, and, I mean, I can understand the arguments for not having anonymity for suspects. I mean, we've we've seen with cases, um, I think it happened in the Rolf Harris case and possibly the Stuart Hall case, um, and certainly in the case of Jimmy Savile, that it's only become clear what actually happened in those cases because um, once the initial reports came out, um, other potential victims were then, then felt confident enough to come forward having said that i do wonder about the justice side of things in that you've got someone who hasn't been convicted of anything who effectively has the stigma of having been a suspect um against them and i know in in um jobs like you know if you're a teacher or you know some other kind of you know prominent public facing position that stigma can actually end people's careers and can ruin their lives so yeah. i'm not sure the current situation is wholly satisfactory but at the same time i think it, it would be difficult to to give uh, suspects complete anonymity. OK, that's kind of a non-answer, because I'm no clearer whether you would do it or leave things, change things or leave them as they are. I would like to see a situation where there was anonymity, perhaps by default, but in some cases judges could waive the anonymity, but perhaps they would waive it on more occasions than happens in, in other situations, say, you know, when people are under 16, because I think then a judge could s decide whether or not there was a reasonable chance that other people uh, okay. would come forward. I'm going to ask you a yes-no question, because I can from this side of the desk. Would you give accused people, such as Mark Pritchard, anonymity before the case is finished? Um, well, like I said, yes, okay. but with a judge being able to overrule Fine. it. Elizabeth Jones, what's your take on it? I don't think you can bring the European Union into this one, can you? Well, I can try. <laughs> Go on, then. Uh, well, I would, because the EU, the, Euro the continental legal system, is very keen on privacy, whereas in this country we have a, a different take. I have to say, Mark Pritchard, well, he would, wouldn't he, to quote the late, great Mandy Rice Davis, of course he's going to say, let's have anonymity. This has gone round the houses multiple times. I'm totally opposed to any rape defendant having anonymity. Why? Totally opposed. Why should they have anonymity? Because he, people could argue he's been found guilty by media attention. I'm get sorry. Much more attention I'm being sorry. If you're a bank robber, if you're a credit card fraudster, if you're a mugger, if you've committed any other crime, you're not allowed that anonymity. But so why just for rape? But he hasn't. So Mark, go ahead. There's a level of stigma associated with the crime of rape that doesn't apply in, in, in some of the other cases that you've talked about there. So, I mean, I, I, surely you must be able to see that if someone is accused, then it turns out that they're, they're not guilty or, you know, that they're not convicted, that, you know, there is damage caused there and that there is at least an argument to say that in some cases that there should be anonymity, to, to say there should never be any anonymity at all. There's a huge imbalance between the accused and the, and the victim in, in, in that case. I can't agree with you at all. In 1976, the law was that both parties had anonymity. This was repealed in 1980, 1988 after the Criminal Law Review Committee in 1984 said, no, this is not the way forward. It deters a rape 
I'm claimant, uh, victims, I'll call them victims, please forgive me, I know no one likes the victim word. It deters rape victims from coming forward. It deters rape victims from going to the police. It makes them nervous about going to court. And look at John Warboys, the legendary Rohypnol taxi driver rapist. If it weren't for him having the publicity on being arrested, 85 women who had been raped by him would never have come forward. It's a great tool for police prosecution. It's a great tool for assisting criminal justice. These victims are entitled to justice and the police are entitled to have their prosecution but, proceeding without hindrance. But aren't the accused entitled to justice as well? And, and you could argue, as Mark has, that if you are exposed as being a defendant against the rape charge, you are effectively being found guilty by the media anyway. Uh, That's not the case at all. You're certainly not found guilty by the media at all. You may be mentioned. I mean, can can you mention to me the names of any rape defendants who were found not guilty? Mark, well, Mark Pritchard, obviously. Well, he wasn't. A, he didn't go through the trial process. He wasn't found not guilty. Mark, no, but there really are. Lo- I, I can't specifically name any cases, but we all know that there are cases where uh, suspects are taken to trial for rape, and it turns out that you know a jury of their peers has found them not guilty. It happens all the time. Well, I'm, so I'm sorry. I'm not really sure what the point you're making. I'm is. sorry. The balance of public interest is that the defendants should not have anonymity. That is the balance of public interest. That is what the Criminal Law Review Committee found. And who am I and who are we to disagree with them? Well, who you are, Elizabeth, is a parliamentary candidate standing for election to potentially make those laws. So, you know, you're obviously entitled to have an opinion. And the idea that we just shouldn't argue against it because, uh, you know, a review in 1988 decided that the current state of affairs is the correct state of affairs. Well, it's also... you know, that, that, that's why we have political debate. Yeah, and it's already been debated in 2008 and 2007 and 1999 and 2003. It's being debated on a regular basis and it always comes back to the same conclusion. Defendants do not have anonymity. Just one, so, one, one example, Coronation Street actor Michael Devell was found not guilty of rape, but he did get yeah. lots of coverage. What would he, 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 he was and, absolutely trusted he's, in the media. He, he's a very famous person, of course. He's got a big reputation, of course. That's, that, that's the risk. That is the public interest, is that people need to have the confidence to come forward in order to pursue a prosecution. Mark, ten, ten seconds to respond. Um, Well, I just think, again, a bit like when we were talking about criminal justice earlier on, an absolutist approach is not helpful in this situation. I agree that there are probably some cases where anonymity should be waived, but to have it as default for every single defendant, I think, is just wrong-headed. It's 20 to 11, still ahead on the BBC Radio Kent, a very lively debate on a couple of more subjects with Elizabeth Jones and Mark Thompson. Good morning, Len Botovic here. On behalf of Ian Collins is away at the minute, and we have got an outstanding news panel in the form of Elizabeth Jones, the UKIP prospective candidate for Dartford, and consummate political blogger Mark Thompson. I hope that was sycophantic enough for the two of you. Uh, We now move (laughs) on to a rather worrying and very, very tragic story which everybody has heard of, the gunmen who have shot 12 people dead at the Paris office of French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. The satirical weekly has courted controversy in the past, it must be said, with its irreverent take on news and current affairs and certain religious matters. The Prime Minister, David Cameron, has urged the protection of free speech and democracy. I know that this House and this country stands united with the French people in our opposition to all forms of terrorism and we stand squarely for free speech and democracy and these people will never be able to take us off those values. The latest uh, being reported is that the French security forces have uh, surrounded the two brothers suspected of carrying out the attack on the magazine. Uh, But as we heard before, this is a developing story, and even what I've told you right now could be out of date. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, what's your take on such considerable violence in a country so similar to the United Kingdom? Well, it's horrific, absolutely horrific, that this really goes to the core of Western values, the expression of freedom of speech. I really don't understand why religion seems to think that it's beyond the scope of criticism and satire. Uh, Within the Christian tradition, we have had a lot of controversy, particularly Mm. quite recently with those Eke Homo, the uh, Swedish photographer, Mm. Elizabeth Wallen. She produced a series of mock-up photographs of Jesus Christ as a gay man. And these caused such controversy that in Serbia in 2012, riot police had to be called and there was a mass demonstration against against her, but she stay, she's still alive. We had the legendary Andre Serrano work, Piss Christ. Mm. Forgive me for saying mm. that, but that's the name of the title. Mm. And that was basically a photograph of Jesus Christ with the artist's urine sprayed over the... Mm. Uh, 
photograph. He was subject to death threats. The piece of work was vandalised, damaged, and then finally removed. But he remains alive. So I understand that many people have strong religious passions. However, this is taking it to another Mm -hmm. level altogether. You simply cannot prevent people from expressing themselves. It's totally unacceptable. It's un 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 and Western. It's not Western values. The latest update on the news is that the men are apparently uh, reported as being holed up in a building owned by a printing company in a town just seven miles from Paris's Charles de Gaulle airport. Mark Thompson, is this about free speech? Is this about something else? Well, I completely agree with everything that Elizabeth just said there. I mean, it is about free speech. And, you know, it is absolutely horrendous to think that, you know, <laughs> that... Uh, religion any religion can suppress free speech i mean i i, I was very encouraged to see um straight after what happened that the uh, je suis charlie um hashtag was was trending on twitter and you know lots and lots of people uh, seem to have got behind that and i know that quite a lot of newspapers on the continent have published the cartoons in solidarity with uh, Charlie Hebdo, mm-hmm. um, although I don't think country um, newspapers in the UK have actually done that uh, in a prominent way yet, although I hope that they will, um, because, you know, it, it, free speech should be an inviolable right, and I think the fear is that what will happen is that publications will actually self-censor. I mean, I think to an extent they already have done, um, and that this is likely to exacerbate that that problem because Charlie Hebdo was obviously one of the most prominent publications mm-hmm. that did publish cartoons and did do things that it thought were right for in terms of free speech and obviously you know the employees of, of that publication have paid a very 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 high price a far too high a price it's an evolving story keep up to date with that and other news on BBC Radio Kent now then a crackdown on noisy buskers in Canterbury begins this month they now risk written warnings, no less, and fines from the City Council if they fail to turn down the music when asked. Vince Heron sold his amplifier after being told by inspectors that apparently he was being too loud. If you want to live in a happy, nice city that's full of vibrancy and different people coming out, giving their different um, views, you know, the street art, this, that, the other, encourage it. So, are buskers a nuisance? Or is this just... Is it another form of begging? Or do buskers add some value to the town? Well, I'm joined today, as you already know, by Elizabeth Jones and Mark Thompson, and I have to tell you that I've taken all of Elizabeth's notes away so she cannot use the UKIP line. Those are her notes, and they're now on the floor. Elizabeth, I'm sure that you haven't got a European position on this. Please tell me you haven't. What do you think of buskers? Should they be licensed or banned? Well, it seems that there's a mood across the nation whereby they are being increasingly licensed. And I think it all depends where they are performing. If you're going to perform with an amp... An amp, yes. If you're going to be performing with an amp and a set of drums and an electric guitar within the square of, let's say, one of our great cathedrals, I think that's not appropriate. For instance, Bath... Bath Abbey, Mm -hmm. around that area, there have been a lot of conflicts uh, with buskers and I think the buskers will be moved on. Uh, And also in Camden, there have been a huge number of very loud buskers causing considerable amount of uh, disturbance to the residents. And now Camden have introduced a licence. £19 per annum if you have no amp, £47 per annum if you have an amp. So, sorry. I was going to ask Mark Thompson, who might be incandescent with rage with your authoritarian suggestions. (laughs) Or maybe not. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just glad that the EU bashing has ceased for a minute. <laughs> Don't provoke um, it. Don't provoke it, please, Mark. <laughs> well, I, I used to live quite near Guildford, and, uh, and me and my wife used to go in shopping quite a lot, and there were often um, buskers on the main street there. In fact, you would often get two or three, because it's quite a long high street, and it kind of goes up. Um, and uh, near the bottom, they used to be able to use um, amps. And I just love that. You're out shopping for the day, and if you want to just stop for five minutes and listen to some music, I think it's a great thing. Um, I mean, having said that, I think the the story it goes into a bit more detail and it talks about how uh, you know some buskers are playing very very late at night in residential areas with amplifiers and stuff and i think there has to be you know there has to be a kind of sense of proportion about this and of course you know there should be a cut off at certain times but i think there is a, a kind of mean spirited feeling running through the reaction to this story in that um you know it should be seen as a joyous thing and i think what the the gentleman in the clip said about vibrancy i think it does add vibrancy to a town or city center to have to, you know to have uh, live music being played. Um, I can see Elizabeth's eyes getting larger and larger with rage as you speak. 
Well, let, let's face it. The word vibrancy is common currency in the estate agency world as the the criminal less desirable areas, let's face it. and That's not a word, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But I know uh, what you mean. Yeah, so in bus- busking, I frankly find busking within the beautiful historical areas of this country offensive. It's, it's inappropriate. Really it's surely Shakespearean sonnets and that exactly. kind of thing. Exactly. They weren't and there, there, there would have been spontaneous acting. They weren't and, you amped. Know. They didn't have pre-recorded backing tracks going boom, 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 All right, boom. So, so Elizabeth, then if they took the amps away, would you still be happy or would you still be kicking off about it? If it was it? a nice string quartet, I wouldn't have an objection. I, have... I see. So, so really what you're against is music that isn't to your taste. No, I'm... A, which, is, which is authoritarian and bigoted? No, I don't mind... Would you say? I don't mind music that's not to my taste if it's nowhere near me and it's, it's <laughs> far away from any beautiful historical site. I, I do believe I heard some very loud chanting at the Rochester by-election by, yes, UKIP. Indeed, I remember that too. <laughs> well, I think we probably probably had... That, that was naturally busking. They weren't, we weren't going around begging for money. We weren't noisy beggars. So, hang on then. What's the UKIP policy on this? Do you licence, ban or regulate... Busking, yes or no? Well, or is it just a personal choice? For me, it's a personal choice. I know that Liverpool Council was very heavy on buskers for a while. They wanted to bring in licensing and public indemnity insurance, but they've taken a back uh, step now and said they, that all buskers must obey a code of conduct about being in certain areas for a period of time, not being too close to certain residential areas, not being close to other buskers. And that seems to be working, but it doesn't seem to be working Ma- in Bath. Mark Thompson, very b- brief answer. They say fair or well, I just, rights. Very I, just think it, I just think it's great to have buskers and jugglers and magicians and all that sort of stuff in town and city centres. I think it really, really adds to the atmosphere, and especially when you're out shopping and you're a bit bored and you just want to take time out for five or ten minutes i I think bring it on thank you bring it on fighting talk thank you thank you thank you to my panelists this morning elizabeth jones who's ukip's prospective parliamentary candidate for dartford and the consummate political blogger mark thompson